I want to speak to you today from the subject, I am not your Isaac. Pray with me. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this time. I pray, God, that I would do no damage to your word, but preach that with your sound doctrine and gospel. I pray for every hearer. God, give them a heart, a mind that they are receptive to your will and your word. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. To begin... Let me share that I've been in oratorical ministry for nearly 16 years and in pastoral ministry for seven of those years. Across that time, Brother Jose, I've sought to preach, teach, and lecture on topics that are relevant to my audience and deeply resonate with me. I can't talk about something that I'm disconnected from. I can't speak on a topic that hasn't mentally stimulated me. And that's why you've heard me preach sermons that lift up our African-American legacy within a culture that seeks to maintain white supremacy. That's why you've heard me preach sermons that reframe the role of women in a society that still pays them less than men for doing the same job. My sermons have connected the importance of spiritual development and social justice. Today's sermon continues that pattern, exploring our ethical responsibility towards one another, and what happens when we use God, when we use faith, or when we use religion to support traumatizing behavior. I think it's unfortunate that we have to spend time talking about treating one another ethically and responsibly, but, but we must. For there are people who believe it's okay to mishandle you. There are people who believe it is okay to mishandle someone else without consequence. Even more, there are those who use theology and faith and religion as their basis for mistreatment. In other words, Sister Julie, in the name of God, we enslave folk. In the name of God, we subjugate folk. In the name of God, we oppress and dehumanize and discard people. In the name of God, they exact nefarious plans that promote their agenda and restrict your free will. Now, before you get all defensive, everyone who's watching this live stream right now, before you get all defensive and turn to another broadcast because you think I'm attacking the church, let me remind you that the biblical text has already been weaponized to support the agendas of slave traders and slave owners. It was already weaponized to limit what women could wear so as not to tempt or beguile men, some faith traditions regulated women's apparel to long skirts and head coverings and no accessories. Women were called Jezebel for wearing red fingernail polish and lipstick. Instead of addressing the undisciplined male pastors and deacons and financiers and trustees who went about sowing their royal oats, often women were made to bear the consequence of sexual impropriety. In the name of God, some pastors donned pulpits on Sunday mornings unleashing a fury 
of contempt against homosexuals, vitriolic attacks on those who are non-heteronormative or non-binary, bulldozed self-esteem, caused irreparable damage to the soul and the psyche of anyone who didn't fit normal. Violent words, church, like faggot, sissy, homo, dyke, bull dagger, tranny, switch hitter, these words and more have been staples in some preaching lexicons, inciting mob-like responses from Sunday morning churchgoers. But while some cheered, others were left to wrestle with a God they loved, but was told didn't love them. While Others rallied behind pejorative words of clergy folk. Others resigned themselves to escaping the church altogether, finding community elsewhere. In the name of God, parents kicked their gay children out of the house into the streets. Did you know, according to the Center for American Progress, 40% of homeless youth identify as gay or transgender. Many say they became homeless when their parents forced them out of the home because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Across the board, Sister Lenora, physical, Verbal, sexual, and alcohol abuse is higher among homeless LGBT youth than their counterparts. Citing the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Levitical laws condemning same-sex relationships, Paul's letter to the Romans, parents have disavowed children, fathers no longer speak to sons, daughters are estranged from others because they have differing views on this particular subject. Unmended failures can lead to years of silence, church. It seems to me that at every turn, some marginalized group is selected for sacrifice. Blacks, then women, then black women, then homosexuals, now transgendered folk. Why must there always be someone on the chopping block? Why must there be a concerted effort to rally against those who do not fit our ideas of normalcy? How many Isaacs have we sacrificed in the name of God? How many Isaacs have we sacrificed in the name of our faith? How many Isaacs have we sacrificed in the name of our religion? Hmm. For you who may be unfamiliar with the story of Abraham and Isaac, the narrative describes Abraham's obedience to God's command to sacrifice Isaac. Consequently, Abraham takes Isaac, his son, and two of his servants to, to a place God is said to have chosen as the place for human sacrifice. Gathering the necessary materials, the wood and the knife, the fire, Abraham proceeds to fulfill the divine command he's heard. As the text unfolds, Abraham builds an altar, putting everything in place to support fulfillment of the sacrifice. Unsuspecting Isaac is bound. I hope you hear that. Unsuspecting Isaac is bound not by someone he didn't know, but bound by his father, Abraham, and laid on the altar. Indeed, he is to be the burnt offering in this moment. Just as Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son, the angel of the Lord calls to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Just as Abraham was about to fulfill this duty, he was halted. 
seeing a ram caught in a nearby bush, Abraham offers it up in place of his son. The pericope ends with reaffirming Abraham as the father of many generations. And he and Isaac returned to the others. Now, most times, this passage is lauded for Abraham's heroic faith in sacrificing his son, his only son, as the text says. Growing up in, in the church, we jump and shout at the prospect of a ram as divine providence. We joyed in Abraham's faithfulness to fulfill this command from God. But if we step back from our holy arousal, <laughs> if we step back just a moment, we'll see that this narrative, as one scholar puts it, is far more complicated than it appears on the surface. The Akita, as it's called in Jewish traditions, actually sheds light on the fact that the core of the narrative actually seems to assume the possibility that God could demand human sacrifice. In other words, somehow, God derives pleasure from us sacrificing one another. To be clear, some scholars have argued that this event marks the transition from one stage of religious development to another, namely the rejection of human sacrifice and the substitution of an animal in its place. Far too many times, we proudly trope this passage as a reason to bind someone up and slay them. We promote this passage as a reason to bind someone and destroy them. Oh my, as, as John Levinson, a Hebrew Bible scholar, notes concerning the Akita, nothing in Genesis 22, 1 through 19 suggests that God's command to sacrifice Isaac was improper. Over and over again, we have derived joy from, sac from someone else's bleeding heart. We have celebrated someone else's pain. We have rubbed salt in the wounds of another's financial, physical, mental, emotional, familial, or sexual struggle. Over and over again, we have sacrificed one another on the altar. We bound them and readied ourselves to kill them. But, church, as philosopher Immanuel Kant reminds us, the commands of ethics are clear. They are certain and without exception. And they do not include the command to kill our own children. They do not include the impact. I will preach this to myself. They do not include the imperative to treat people as means to an end. How we treat each other matters. Yes. How you speak to your children, how you speak to your spouse, how you speak to your partner, your lover, your side piece, all of it matters. How you render them invisible, how you render them unimportant, how you render them non-human, like trash to be used and discarded, all of it matters. Yeah, church. If I speak passionately about this, it's because the older I get, the more I understand the fragility of life and the necessity of ensuring right relationships and behaviors toward each other. Uh, listen, almost three weeks ago, we laid my God brother to rest. And Friday night, we were all on a Zoom call enjoying one another. And Saturday, he was gone. If, if nothing else, that sudden loss got me thinking about how temporal we are. Yeah. It got me reflecting on how much time we spend sacrificing ourselves for the comfort of others or even sacrificing others to appease us. Oh, my. Uh, uh, 
If, if, if I speak, if I speak passionately about this, because it got me thinking about how often church, we dim ourselves in order for others to shine. Uh, that, well, as far as I'm concerned, Sister Lenore, the time for that is over. I am not your Isaac. You are not my Isaac. I am not here to sacrifice you on the altar for my own joy. And you, oh my, oh my, Amy, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, have you ever had someone try to sacrifice you on their altar for their own joy, for their own pleasure, for their own celebration? Then you need to declare, I am not your Isaac. I am not the thing you can pick up and put down at your own whim. I am not just something to be played with. Uh, my emotions matter. My, my feelings actually matter. Oh my goodness. Let me tell you something, church. People will use you and hate you at the same time. They will extract your gift, oh my, and diminish your personhood if you let them. Oh, ha, oh, they'll flock to hear you preach and to hear you sing and then retweet the rumor about you on Twitter. And then, uh, oh my goodness, y'all ain't saying nothing to me today. <laughs> they'll call you for prayer and, and at the same time forward images of you all across Instagram. Condemn you to hell because you don't fit the normal but still ask you for money to pay their bills. I'm trying to tell you, there comes a point where you have to make the decision that I am not your Isaac. <laughs> I am not the thing that will be sacrificed, that will be played with, that will be bound and put on the altar for slaughter. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. <laughs> uh, we are human beings, church, with real Fragilities. We are human beings with real feelings. We are human beings, oh my God, who live in a complex, complicated, nuanced space of reality. I, I, I preach this uh, passionately, church, because we haven't addressed the trauma associated with this. We haven't talked about what Isaac must have really felt being bound by the one he loves. I'm preaching to those of you out there who are just so dogmatic in your faith, who are unmoved, who stand still, as you say, on the word of God, and you are unmoved, and at the same time, you are driving your daughter away. Oh my God. At the same time, you are driving your son away. At the same time, you are causing discord in your family. All because you are standing, standing on the word. In the name of God, you have caused discord. In the name of God, you have belittled children. In the name of God, you have demeaned other people. In the name of God, I am here to tell you it is not right. It is wrong and it is unethical and dare I say it's unholy. Oh my. I am not your Isaac. <laughs> This is why, in part, this is why there are so many untimely deaths. Pastors who are forced to deal with belligerent people, belligerent congregations, who resist, who push against the forward move of ministry. They end up with all kinds of anxieties physical manifestations due to the trauma they've experienced, cancers and strokes and heart attacks, congregations who have sacrificed pastors on the altars of tradition. <laughs> Parents who did not live into the dream they have for themselves, but then turn around and force their children to live out their hopes. Because you didn't become the NFL player, because you didn't become the NBA player, because you didn't 
graduate because you didn't do what you wanted to do. You are now trying to live out your dream through your children. Not so, not so. God has a dream, a destiny for them specifically that they will have to live out. They will have to live into it. Oh, but it's not just parents who are sacrificing children on the altars. There are children who are sacrificing parents on altars as well. Children who are unruly, ungrateful, who, who are entitled brats, and who don't appreciate the hard work of their parents. I believe I'm preaching to somebody today. Yeah. Don't, children who don't know the value of hard work or the importance of patience and perseverance and resilience. Uh, I'm come, I've come to tell you, your parents are not your Isaac. Uh, I am not your Isaac. You are not my Isaac. We should not be sacrificing each other on these altars. There's another kind of ethic. I know, I gotta go. My time is up. There's another kind of ethic that Jesus is trying to teach us. There's another kind of way of being in the world. Yeah, and it's not just that that flimsy kind of, you know, I love you, you love me. No, no, this is this is that kind of agape love. This is this is that love that transcends the boundaries of, of who you identify yourself as. This is the kind of love that transcends the boundaries of what we identify and define sin as. This is the kind of love that, uh, that transcends the boundaries, church, of our own transgressions. This is the kind of love, oh my God, that will go down into hell, find me where I am, and then pick me up out of hell to take me to heaven. Big church, y'all, y'all don't even understand what I'm saying. I'm trying to tell you that that, that, that agape love, that the love of Jesus, Jesus will find us right where we are. It'll find us if you have been sacrificed on anybody's altar. If you have been sacrificed on the altar of capitalism, I'm here to tell you that you can get up. There's a ram. There is a ram caught in a thicket. You are not the sacrifice. If you have been sacrificed on behalf of your mother or your father's dreams, I'm here to tell you you are not the sacrifice. There's a ram caught Caught in a thicket. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the Akita. The Akita is teaching us something far beyond Abraham's faith and far beyond Abraham's dedication to fulfill this divine command. It's teaching us something else. We need to actually start questioning this. What does it mean? Did God really sanction the sacrifice of a child? One's own child? Or is there something else going on here? Because we've used this text to sanction us sacrificing each other. <laughs> Binding each other up. Binding each other up so we can slay one another. That's not the way of Christ. I don't know if this is going to turn into a series, but what I do know is there comes a point in everyone's life where you have to make the decision, the determination, that I am not anyone. I will not be sacrificed on anyone's altar. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for what our ears have heard, what our hearts have felt. I pray, God, that this word would take root in someone's heart and mind. I pray that for the person who is bound by the definitions that their family has given, the definitions that their co-workers have given of who they are, I pray that they would be liberated. For the person, God, who has been bound by what normal is and 
or is supposed to be, that they would be liberated long enough to live into the fullness of who they really are. I pray for every person who has heard this sermon, I ask you, Lord, to bless, keep, and strengthen them. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Listen, I truly believe that in Christ there is liberation. I truly believe it. And this is why I preach a gospel of social justice and liberation. Because when it says that he came to set the captives free, I don't think that just means he, he came to set them free spiritually. He came to set them free physically. He came to set them free mentally, financially. I want to make this invitation to you. If you have not come into the liberating power of Jesus, here's your chance. Just by believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth, that God raised him from the dead. The, the Bible says that you will be saved. Just as simple as that. For those of you out there who may be watching and you, you are one of those who have been sacrificed. I want you to know that there's space for you here. We're not a perfect church, but we are a loving church. We're a forgiving church. And we will walk alongside you as you grow in your journey, your walk with Christ. For either, for those of you who have just accepted Christ into your hearts, and for those of you who are looking for a church home, go to our website. There's information there. We want to be in relationship with you. 